at the why and the how of Jesus coming to earth from heaven. And then the final four lines form an affirmation of faith. We affirm the success of Jesus' rescue mission in spite of our lack of understanding of the mysteries associated with it. There's a lot of mysteries. This is the biggest mystery of all. Let's sing about it, even though we can't tell why, we're going to do our best by singing about it. Okay?
that's a good start. I'm pleased to welcome you here this morning. Part of my responsibility is to be sure that you're welcome. Cedar Creek is unique as a church family. Well, yes, every family is unique. I need the mic here. Okay, that's true. Every family is unique. But I'm proud to be part of the Cedar Creek family. I'm happy to be part of it. And I know our time together today is going to be valuable and meaningful as we leave here. We're better than when we came. Or more blessed. It's a greater understanding of an important subject that Don has got some significant things to share with us. You know, there's an announcement section in our bulletin. It's pretty much self-explanatory. I think you can read it and decide to what extent you want to participate in things that are being announced. The most important thing we're going to say, maybe we'll say it more than once today, is to have continued prayers for the Morosky family and for baby Andrew as he's still in the hospital. The family is under a lot of stress through this. And they are sold by our prayers and our support. Uh, we are, have an opportunity for a mission DVD. There were several that we were looking at as we went to choose. I choose the last one called the Tour de France. Can you do that? And we'll sing some more after that. Send a nugget for the West Bangladesh mission. And this morning was going to be something special. We were to present eight new bicycles to our gospel outreach workers. These have been donated by one of our kind viewers who realized the need for transportation. To tell our donor that uh, they have uh, given us uh, this honorable support uh, to this bicycle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a privilege to see their faces and appreciation. <laughs> I couldn't resist the urge to have a ride myself. I followed a couple of the workers as they did a little tour of the nearby village, which is known for its basket work. It was so interesting to see the intricate work that they were doing. In Bangladesh, everyone is willing to stop and talk, and people welcome a prayer. Life is simple in the village. Things have to be fixed, animals have to be cared for. We passed a small factory for making charcoal. Children are often working, but trees have to be climbed, and homemade toys are just as good. This man's bicycle is being used on the farm, but our gospel outreach bicycles will also be kept busy. This man needs to hear the good news. And so does this lady making fuel for the fire. This man needs to stop and listen. And so does this man. We showed our workers the new tracts sponsored by the General Conference, the Korean Union and the Bangladesh Union. They are especially designed to appeal to an Islamic culture. That has been donated by Korean donors, uh, $10,000 to share the gospel to work uh, this 
Muslim space of Hindus and onwards to the people. We expect a big interest in these people of the book tracts. Let me tell you about Provis, one of our gospel outreach volunteers. He works in the village of Banuria. I watched as a couple of his candidates were baptized. One was a spirit worshipper. He used to drink too much and was a little wild, but Provis made friends with them. He gave him tracts to read, studied with them, and the man started to listen and agree with what he heard. I was so happy to see him demonstrate his faith through baptism. I presented him with a Bible recorder paid for by our Gospel Outreach viewers. Think about adopting a young worker like Provis as he continues to share the good news in Bangladesh. These Gospel Outreach workers need our continuing regular support. Thank you for the bicycles you helped provide. I'm holding my Bible in a hand here and reading Galatians six. Verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And that's the text that inspired hymn number 154, which we're going to sing. As long as there is breath in me, I will be an advocate of the, the old hymns of the past that have survived hundreds of years. And so maybe we only get to do it once a month or so, but I'll be an advocate. And here's one man that I'll advocate, and we'll sing two of his songs, and his name is Isaac Watts. 350 years ago, he was born in England. Almost. His family was of the Huguenot ancestry. Do you know of the Huguenots? Who were persecuted for their religious convictions? He wasn't a very healthy guy, and he only got to be five foot tall. That's not very tall, so he wasn't very imposing as a person that way. But his creativity, his ability to versify, as it's called, was almost beyond measure. And so, I have a comment here by Matthew Arnold. He said that this hymn, number 154, is the finest hymn in the English language. And even Charles Wesley came a little later. He had great praise for this hymn. And and, um, he should know he wrote 6,500 hymns himself. So this is old school kind of music in a way, but think about the verse that's involved as we sing hymn number 154, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. main 
things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, so A quick review of some of Don's presentation this morning. I was impressed to move in this direction of these two songs. The next one written by Isaac Watts is 163. At the Cross. And um, there's a lot of things that could be said, but we're going to run out of time and save it for Don. So what I can say, if you remember Fanny Crosby and who she was, she said... Her soul flooded with a celestial light. She was blind. So her soul flooded with a celestial light at the time of her conversion when this hymn was sung. Number 163. Alas! sovereign die would he devote a sacred head for such a one as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day was it for crimes that I have done he suffered on the tree amazing pity grace unknown and love beyond degree at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Number three of 163. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith and now I am happy all the day okay we have this special time it's a congregational Opportunity to share with one another blessings, concerns, prayer requests. And so, there's a mic here. While Christine has, is preparing to come down here for our prayer, if anyone else wants to join her up front, we can do so. And Beatrice, too.
precious Father in heaven, here we are, your children. We love you so much. We thank you for being our God, a God who is full of mercy and goodness and truth, a God who can do all that we imagine and more. Thank you for being that God, for saving us and for giving us a purpose in our lives. Help us, dear Father, at this time, with all the petitions we have heard and the joys and the celebrations and the sorrows. Help us to be a light to those families and those people where we can support them. For we have proclaimed them to you, and we we look to you for guidance, and we look to you for empowerment, and we look to you for love and tenderness and protection for all the people that we can take care of around us. Please be with our church family here, and again, all those requests that were mentioned. You know each individual request, those that were spoken and those that we don't speak out loud. Please guide us with your precious spirit, that we may be comforted, that we may be empowered. And thank you for this Sabbath day that we can come here and commune with other people who believe as we believe and help us to always be a support and a joy. Joy doesn't mean necessarily happiness, but it means a a firm commitment that we know that we have an end to all of this here, that we know there's something better to hope for. Help us to have heaven here on earth with those around us that we can empower. And now we ask for your guidance in Dawn's message that you have given us to give to us. Please bless us with your love and your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. be part of this story. I mean, she wants to bring some friends up here to the front row. Uncle Don has something to tell them. Good morning. How many of you have had a fish aquarium, or maybe you have a fish aquarium now, with fish in it, not like Mr. Knittle with rattlesnakes. <laughs> Does anybody have fish tank? I think, don't you guys have fish tank at your place? Just one? Big one, right? Anybody else? Yeah? What kind of fish do you have? Um, we have, we had two algae eaters, but one of them died. Yeah, that happens. One algae eater? I like algae eaters. Well, let's see if I can... Does anybody know what that is? It's called a sword tail. Can you figure out how it got its name? (laughs) This is a pineapple sword tail. And when my little boy, Micah, was maybe eight or nine, he, because his dad had aquariums, he got his own aquarium and he had some pineapple sword tails and then he had a tank and we like life plants because that's more natural and so one day he was working on it and he he says dad i can't find my sword tail and so what do you do when you can't find a fish in a fish tank you go look well yeah you can you can get everything out it sounds like you've got some experience with this (laughs) but we looked down one side and then went to the other side and looked down that side and we just couldn't find it anywhere. So um, kind of started looking around outside and then Micah found something that looked just like this. You can take that and pass it on. You want to take it and you can just pass it on. What does that look like? Ugh. Fuzz. Fuzzy. 
with some legs. Well, some fins maybe. So sword tails like to jump. And this sword tail jumped out of the tank and went behind the dresser. And I don't know if you know, like at your house, but sometimes vacuuming behind the dresser doesn't happen regularly. <laughs> and so stuff accumulates back there. And so he, he got this, and it was his fish. And I am not kidding. That looks a lot like his fish looked. So he put the fish back in the water. And I'm a little bit concerned at this point, because you know what fish do when they're out of the water? What face do they make? Right? Then we put it back in the tank, and it still was making the same faces. And it was just, ugh, all this fuzzy, and now it's wet. And I'm starting to think, oh boy, I'm going to have to have a hard conversation. We're going to have to make a decision. But then the most amazing thing I've ever seen a fish do happened. Have you ever seen a dog when it's all wet and it shakes? This fish shook and it bent up and it snapped its tail. And I am not kidding. In less than a second, there's a fuzz ball and there's a fish with no fuzz on it. I am not, I've never seen anything like it in all my years keeping fish, which was a long time. That fish has a slime coat on it, and evidently it was able to just scoot right out from all of that fuzz, and that fuzz was just left behind. And all I could think of is that reminds me a lot of what Jesus says to us. Sometimes Jesus says we want, he wants us to be one way, and we think, that kind of looks nice over there. I'm going to go over there, and we go where he doesn't want us to, and then we feel all dirty. But you know what he says? He says, just come back to me. Ask me to forgive you. He says that he'll, though our sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. Have you ever seen white wool? I can't say that I really have seen white wool before, really. I've seen brown wool because most of the sheep I see have been out in the dirt. But check this out. Have you ever seen that before? That's what he was talking about when he said that he'd make our sin, make our uh, as white as wool. So I want you to remember that no matter how bad you've been, no matter how bad things are, Jesus offers to forgive us and make us white as wool. You can go back to your seats now. As our <clears throat> ushers are making their way forward here for the call for the offering, or take the offering, I'll just make a couple of brief comments. As you have noticed in your bulletin, this is about the Oregon Conference Youth Support is the focus of the offering this morning. Uh, that's a significant thing in my world. Thinking about the role that the church has played in supporting our young people, and the various programs that are orchestrated and designed for to keep our young people with the uh, awareness of this family that they're part of and to want to commit themselves further. This goes through youth camps and scholarship programs. So we're, it's wonderful that we can be part of an organization that has this diverse range of support especially for our youth. Of course, the whole, whole organization, the denomination and the local conference has a lot of different responsibilities, all of which are supported by the, the funds, the tithes and offerings that we, support, we give. So may that be the case this morning again. Dear Father in heaven, you are the one who owns... You said even the 
the cattle on a thousand hills. You are the creator of all things. And it was part of your plan that we can be involved with you in the in the way we use the blessings that we've been given and share one with another. So as we take our offering this morning, we ask that it will be multiplied in, in, in the various ways that our church leadership has for these dollars. May the fruit be as anticipated and even more. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to stand down here because I'm not a pastor. <laughs> And I'm just one of you. And as, as I was preparing this week, I was thinking about um, the different states that people come to church in. And some people are maybe on a mountaintop experience, and other people are going through a valley. And I just want to let you know that if, if we were to have a bell curve, I'm right in the middle of that bell curve. I'm just like you. If you struggle, um, I can relate. And I struggle, but I praise God that every single day I can wake up and start clean with a fresh slate. And um, David Ashrick, I, I listened to a sermon he gave, and he said, um, basically, you know, we just keep getting up. It's just don't give up. Just keep getting up. So I'm going to pause for prayer, and then we'll move forward. Dear Father, I want to lift up a couple things before I ask that you be with us. I want to lift up Arana D. What, what a privilege to know these, these people and what a testimony their marriage has been, and I just thank you for them. I also want to lift up two babies. The world doesn't understand why babies have to suffer, and sometimes we don't. But I pray that as we draw closer to you, that we'll understand that it's free will and choice that allows us to choose you, but it's also the bad choices that have resulted in sin and suffering. And I pray that we will make that distinguishment um, between suffering. So I lift up these babies. I pray that you will watch over them, that you'll send angels to be with them, and that you'll send your spirit to be with their families. And now, Father, here I am. I just want to step behind you right now. And I pray that your love and your mercy will show through. And that those people that need to be fed personally will be fed personally. And those people that are seeking to know how to be more effective may um, gain something from today that will help them reach a world that largely doesn't know you. And we think they've rejected you, but they haven't even seen you yet. So please help us be you to this world. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's interesting how God works because our lesson fits so well with a kind of a launching point um, where I want to go. And so the title is All People, Lord? Question mark. Um, is there anybody that we can discount or write off? And I, I can't answer that question, so I'm going to let the Bible answer that question for us. Make sure I'm... Okay, so there's synchronized. If you have your Bibles, turn to um, 1 Timothy 2, and let's see what your Bible has to say about who God's interested in. So 1 Timothy uh, starts out in verse 1. It says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercession, and thanksgiving be made for Seventh-day Adventists. No, it says all people, doesn't it? Um, before we move on, I just want to catch the word Thanksgiving because if you pay attention, you'll see over and over that Thanksgiving is an essential part of the experience as a Christian. And I, I think back just a couple weeks ago with Daniel 6, and you remember um, in Daniel 6 it said that Daniel was recognized because of his excellent spirit. And not exactly sure what comes to mind when you hear that, but we know that he was able to move to the top 
kind of leadership positions in two different governments that he worked under in relatively quickly. And so I think that that excellent spirit was part of this Thanksgiving because when you read further in the sixth chapter of Daniel, you read about him praying three times a day, and each time he prayed out loud, and Thanksgiving was a part of that experience. And so it's important for us to remember to be positive and to thank God for the good things that he's done for us. All people, for kings and for those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Chapter 3, this is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom uh, for all people. A couple things there. Um, Paul tells us that he wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. Then he defines what a knowledge of truth is in the very next verse where he says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, and the man Jesus Christ who gave himself a ransom for all people. Did, did Christ only die for those that would accept him? We agree. He, he died for humanity what a waste for somebody to not accept that gift. And what a shame if they'd never even have a chance to reject it because they've never heard it. Uh, moving, did I, they go too, okay, sorry. Uh, this has been a witness to all, to, uh, this has now been a witness at the proper time And for this purpose, I was appointed as a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. The true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing. If you study the life of Paul, he had some pretty interesting conversations where he went and talked about, remember the unknown God, and he he tried to connect to people. So he was really good about understanding what other people believed and then trying to figure out where do we overlap in knowledge and understanding? How can we have a discussion uh, where we have some relevance to each other? And I want to I want to really talk about this today in the context of atheism, uh, because a big part of our society today is atheist. And I think in some cases we've kind of just written it off. It's like, well, there's nothing I could say or do. They've made a choice, and yet the Lord's put a burden on my heart that. Uh, we need to have a message. We need to have an answer for anybody that asks what we believe. It doesn't mean that we'll change them, but we need to have a legitimate uh, response when people ask. And I think it's important as we think about, as we deliver the message that he points out here, without anger and disputing, there's been times in history where the way that the message was presented totally discounted it. It lost its power because it wasn't presented in the context of Jesus. Here's what Ministry of Healing has to say on that. It says, Christ's methods alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. And only then, right, then he bade them follow me. External focus. He wasn't focused on what he was going to get. He was focused on what he was able to give for people. These are the methods that we need to learn as a family if we want to be effective in witnessing for him. I I did a little study. We all have biases built into us. And by the time a baby is nine months old, they already have uh, facial recognition with their own race. And I want to be careful, this isn't bigotry or whatever, it's just that with their own race, there's a connection that that is recognizable. And the way they did this was they played um, like calm, happy music, and they played music that was um, sad. And when they played sad music, they noticed that babies by nine months were looking more towards other races. And when they heard happy music, they tended to focus on their own race in pictures. So my point is, whether or not... You know, we, we want to accept it. I think it's important we do. But we all have bias built into us. And, um, you know, I, as I thought about this, uh, you know, Ford or Chevy, you know, um, Seattle Seahawks, Patriots, you know. And, and is it based on how they perform 
or is there some other bias that comes in? Um, some of us are born into, you know, Chevrolet or whatever. So my point is that if, if we recognize this, then it can help us be more objective when we're having discussions, um, having a, a clearer, open uh, mind as we do that. So Jesus addressed bias with the Pharisees in Matthew 7, 5. He says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The Pharisees had lots of, lots of problems with bias. Um, in Sabbath school, you know, I read in John uh, 8, and you know, they, they, they were so certain that they knew what it was, and Jesus didn't fit the, what they expected. And so they ended up rejecting him, even though the truth was right in front of them. And so each of us need to be careful that we're not like that in some way. One of my favorite sayings now is, um, this is accredited to Mark Twain, it ain't what you know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. (laughs) I thought I had enough gas in the car, right? It's the things you think that we have to be careful of. And that's true on both sides, whether you're talking about an atheist or whether you're talking about Christians, we all need to be careful of this. So here's some Christian bias towards atheists that that I um, thought about. They're not reasonable. How could they think we came from a monkey? Really? I mean, come on. Um, And I'm I'm embarrassed to say I've actually heard people refer to atheists as ignorant, stupid, or dumb. Um, It is true they also say that about us. So, but um, one one wrong doesn't justify another. And then. there's a story. How many, I'm just curious. How many have had um, education where they were exposed to evolution? So just a small handful of this room. And that's really what I expected and why I wanted to share some of this information. In 1860, there was a debate. and It wasn't really a debate, but it kind of ended up being that way. There was a presentation of a paper. And Wilberforce was a Christian creationist, and Huxley was a scientist. And um, unfortunately, here's what the Christian said. Um, and, and this is how it's remembered, best remembered today for the heat exchange in which Wilberforce supposedly asked Huxley whether it was from his grandfather or his grandmother that he claimed his descendant from a monkey. Does that ta- pass the test of Christ's methods alone? I mean, that, this is, I am embarrassed that a Christian would have a comment like this because it, it is so ego-driven and um, because of this, this is how Christians are judged. This is part of it. There's other, other elements of it. Um, and then listen to his response, Huxley's response, um, that he would not be ashamed to have a monkey for an ancestor, but he would be ashamed to be connected with a man who used his great gifts to obscure truth. Wow. So when we're dealing with people that are are from the the school of thought around evolution, I want to be careful that we recognize that some of these people are absolutely brilliant, um, but they're only working with the information they have, just like all of us are. And so I I just, I pray that we'll never allow um, our personal feelings or biases treat somebody in a way that Christ wouldn't, because all you're doing is severing any chance of really having a witness when you do that. So here's some of the atheist biases uh, that I've found towards Christians. Not reasonable. Um, they're looking for material evidence that there's a God. So the electromagnetic universe is what they see. It's real. I can touch it. Um, things outside of that, they just don't see evidence to support that it's real. There is no God. And I want to pull up and just talk about Darwin for a minute because I the, the next guy... Um, Bible is fiction. Yuval Noah Harari. I'll talk about him, but he starts talking about suffering, and I had no idea the connection between atheism and suffering. And in fact, um, our hospital, within our department, we um, did a little thing for for presenting to our patients. So we have this monitor, and each of us said, you know, um, I'm trying to remember my my purpose. Um, you know, behind where I work. And I spent like two months dwelling on this because I, I, I kept thinking about all the act- actions that I did, but I really was struggling with my purpose. And I finally came to relieving suffering. And this was before I'd studied this material. And since then, I would um, maybe update that because sometimes we can't relieve it, but we can just be present 
we can share in suffering. Um, so anyway, Darwin is interesting. He uh, was going to college. I've heard some people say he was actually in theology, but I wasn't able to find that on the Internet, my source of truth. Um, but he left, and he went on this two-year journey around the world. And one of the things that was going on with Darwin is, at that time, the, the understanding of God was that God was sovereign. And so everything that happened, God had ordained it. So suffering, children dying, all of these terrible things that somehow there was some good that God intended, so he actually ordained that this happens and this happens and this happens. And so that was the view that that Darwin had been exposed to in terms of God's character. Um, He was struggling with that, and unfortunately he went on this journey and he was looking to nature, and when he looked to nature he just saw more and more evidence of suffering. Um, he came up with, you know, the survival of the fittest and wrote the book, um, Origin of Species. Um, but what people don't know about Darwin oftentimes is that Darwin's wife was a very devout Christian. And his faithfulness and love for her actually kept him from pushing his beliefs earlier. He held back for a long time. And then um, his oldest daughter, who was very much, I think, like him, a very gifted child, um, lost her at 10 years of age, and it just broke his heart. I believe God's heart is broken that Charles Darwin couldn't find him because he, he paid the price for everyone. And so I, I'm just trying to open your heart up to there is not a person that will walk this planet that God doesn't love, and his love isn't conditioned on how they treat him or whether they accept or not. He just loves them. And those of us that have kids, I think, have a better chance of getting that. Um, so the, the, the Bible fic- is a fiction. This guy, you all know, Harari, um, is an Israeli. He's, I think he's 42 years old, and he's written a couple books, but incredible mind. But he, he you know, in, the, in these conversations, they pick at things. They, they find a way, because of their bias, to pull out, and he refers to the Bible as fiction. And yet, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that you would have to say you could substantiate, that there's also a lot of truth in the Bible, even if you disbelieve a lot of... Um, the things that that are more spiritual. Um, A funny story related to that. My dad took uh, geology at San Diego State University, and at the beginning of the the quarter, the the professor said, I know some of you are Christians, some of you are creationists. I'm fine with that. It just has no place in this classroom. We are coming from an evolutionary background. End of story. So later... um, in the, the year, we uh, they, they had a trip out into the desert, and I don't know, you know, we're probably 150 miles from the coast or something, and we're in the middle of the desert, and my, my brother and I were like probably about maybe four or five um, at the time. It was We were before school, and so we're in this this big cave, not about half the size of this church probably. There's a fire, and all the people are... Um, sitting around. And honestly, in my mind, I reflected back, and it was very much the same as we did a lot of camping with church back then. And it, it felt like church, really. And, um, you know, for, for many, uh, this whole idea of evolution is their religion. Um, but at any rate, there, he, he begins to talk, and my brother and I were, you know, of the school that you were to be seen but not heard, so we're playing. And, and ironically, we're playing in the sand with these little shells and stuff, and the professor starts talking. He says, well, so here we are, 150 miles from the ocean, and yet we look around and we see all of this evidence of marine life. How is it possible that... You know, with this far inland, and we have all this evidence. And my little brother says, "The flood." <laughs> and it was just no acknowledgement whatsoever, just stone cold, uh, nothing. And yet, you know, there's a seed that went out in that moment from this naive little child that he had an explanation um, for how that happened. So anyway, just just kind of sh- share that. So th- there's bias on both sides. So you, you know, you've all know a Harari, um, and I, if you're interested at all, he, t- he has a talk about nationalism versus globalism, and I believe that this name is going to become household at some point. Um, we know that, that the most effective way to get people is when you mix some truth and error, and um, I think this guy's sincere, but I also think that he... Um, 
he has some error and is is actually shifting on a global scale perspectives that are advancing um, the end times. And we'll see if you agree with me after we read this. He's written two books, uh, Sapiens is a Brief History of Humankind, purely from a scientific background looking back, and then Homo Deus, and this book is scary, uh, from what he shared, A Brief History of Tomorrow. And I, I'll just let you know that... A secular person is looking at the next hundred years, and he says, we're going to be in crisis in less than 50. The 3D printers that they're creating, we saw Bangladesh, they aren't going to have work. The people that are working um, at a lot of people facing jobs is going to be replaced with computers. When we went through this in the industrial age, people less agriculture took the same skills and went over, and then they started working in a factory. We're talking about people computer programmers, and if you don't have that skill, there's just not going to be a lot of room for those positions. So all of a sudden, globally, there's going to be this huge uh, loss of work. And what are we going to do about that? So these are some of the issues that he's talking about. So that's why I say uh, I don't believe from a Christian standpoint what he's saying, but some of the things he's talking about reality and where we're going uh, is is pretty amazing. But listen to the 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 Um, influence that he has. By combining profound insights with remarkably vivid language, Sapiens has already acquired almost cultic status among diverse audiences, captivating teenagers as well as university professors, animal rights activists alongside government ministers. It's currently being translated into close to 30 languages. So a lot of these things are good, but what struck me was I've always wondered how in the end are we going to pull everything together because all these diverse groups, and yet he's finding um, that there are things that are global issues that everybody has an interest in, and talking about those, and um, that's what's pulling people together in a way that that we just haven't seen before. Interview with him, um, talks in the last 100 years, people are losing their ability to be in touch with their bodies and their senses, to hear, to smell, to feel. More and more attention goes to screens, like I'm doing right now, um, to what is happening elsewhere some other time. If you are back in touch with your body, you will feel much more at home in this world also. Um, So what I'm going to do here is like Jesus at the woman at the well. I'm going to say what he says, and then I'm going to share with what uh, the Spirit of Prophecy says. But a hundred years or more before he said these things. Um, So he's talking about the fact that um, within this world today, we have it better than we've ever had it, but we're no happier than we've been. That more people die from self-inflicted gunshot wounds than all the wars being fought around the world. And that in many cases, more people are dying or, or ill from too much food than too little food. So things have been turned upside down, and yet we're no happier. Something's wrong. And he's saying that we've become disconnected. A little lady by the name of Mrs. White uh, wrote this comment. Between the mind and the body, there is a mysterious and wonderful relation. They react upon each other to keep the body in healthy condition, to develop its strength, that every part of the living machinery may act harmoniously should be the first study of our life. To neglect the body is to neglect the mind. It cannot be to the glory of God for his children to have sickly bodies or dwarfed minds. Pretty much kind of saying a very similar thing, except we had this message over 100 years ago. The things that she wrote are so relevant today. And if nothing else, I hope that that as you see some of these quotes, you'll realize that God has truly been trying to create a generation that was aware to answer the questions that would be coming up in the time that we're living in. So this one, it gets scary here. How do we get people to, um, governments to relinquish power? It's going to, is it going to take a war to get there? And um, power is a big deal. That was what Rome had. And I honestly think that Rome is a model for probably something very similar to what we'll see. Because at the time of Christ, you remember, um, Roman had all this power, but they allowed these these uh, other subcultures to be um, living within that. So the Jews had their culture, but it still was under Roman power. And that's kind of what I could see happening in the last days. 
So one option, he says, that some people talk about is only a catastrophe can shake humankind and open the path to the real system of global governance. And they say that we can't do it before the catastrophe, but we need to start laying the foundation so that when the disaster strikes, we can react quickly. Any of these words coming, jumping out at you? But people will not just have the motivation to do such a thing before disaster strikes. When I heard this, I had chills because um, my limited understanding of the great controversy, I started having thoughts come back from things I'd read. Um, so he's talking about a catastrophe to, to create the motivation that people need to actually do something. He's talking about planning now so that when the disaster strikes, we'll be able to react quickly. Here's uh, something from Great Controversy. I was asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen. I was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness of Laodicea, you and me. Laodicea, this is connecting with us. He actually is using the same word, shaking. He says shake, she says shaking. Same language. The time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess, which many are too indolent to obtain. Indolent isn't used a lot these days, <laughs> but it means lazy or not motivated. He says we're not motivated. It, whether we're in the church or the out of the church, we're all waiting. We're procrastinating. This is exactly what the Bible told us that would be happening. And then uh, finally... We are standing on the threshold of the crisis of all ages. In quick succession, the judgments of God will follow one after another, fire and flood and earthquake with war and bloodshed. We're talking about something that the world has never seen before and um, on a scale that it's never seen before. And I would just ask you to think about what did we do after 9-11 in, in the spirit of protecting safety? We limited our freedom. And when people feel threatened, they will continue to limit freedom to get a sense of security. So, revelation is being fulfilled. Here is an interesting thing. And, and again, part of why I'm sharing this is where does our understanding and where does the world's um, understanding overlap? Because that's the space that we can start a conversation in with people and say, you know what, we agree with you um, on these issues. So, his answer, he does a lot of talk when he talks about fiction, about how do, you, how do you determine what's real and what's fiction? How do I know for sure that something is real? And these are his words. If it can suffer, it's real. If it can't suffer, it's not real. So I want to pull up for just a minute. Um, part of the reason that people have left the church, in fact, uh, listen to Wes. Peppers, and, and he made the statement that the doctrine of eternal hell has driven more people from the church than any other belief. And recognize that most of the people that are atheists, that's what they're thinking of as Christianity. We have truths, specifically as Seventh day Adventists, that people just aren't familiar with. And God's called us to be a witness for Him, to get the truth out there. Um, hearing about Dick Hall, who's a hero of mine. Um, you know, he spoke here. Remember, he would come with his little Toyota. I love that man. He, he's an amazing man. Um, but to hear of one guy that has 7,000 lives, souls, as a result of his work um, is inspiring to me. I don't want to compare or contrast. I just want to say it inspires me. What could we do as a church if we understood in such a way that we could give testimony for what our experience has been and people could see a difference in us? So, um, if it's if it can suffer, it's real. Is that good news? Do we have? Is there anything that that connects with Christianity that we could share on suffering? Fifty four verses in the Bible talk about the suffering of Christ, and that's Old Testament and New Testament. Um, that's at least fifty. Because again, this is the internet, so it wasn't my research. Um, but but listen to what Acts, what we hear. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets that His Christ would suffer, um, He has thus fulfilled. 
I have grown up a Seventh day Adventist. I've been um, immersed or exposed to the 2300 days and all these time prophecies. And I have to tell you, for me, it's been largely background noise because that wasn't essential for my um, understanding of God personally. I am shifting very quickly because it is essential for us if we want to have something to talk about to people that need tangible evidence that there's a God. If they don't know God for themselves, they're saying, what physical evidence? We may not be able to give them physical evidence, but we absolutely can talk about a God that free before things happened, warned that they were going to happen. And not only that, he delivered exactly on time. Was it Cyrus that 100, 150 years or something before he was born that, that the prophet said that he would be the one to overthrow? There's, there's these time prophecies that if we are intelligent and, and take people and walk through that, um, there, there's something tangible that we can to show people. Um, David Ashrick, Ty Gibson, you know, there's several other prominent speakers within our church that came from an atheistic background. And I know for sure that David's experience, uh, David Ashrick, was somebody gave him a great controversy. And that was how he made his way into the church. And he was an atheist. Um, so from God's Amazing Grace, page 187, and I recognize that within this group, some of us need, we're still struggling to have that personal connection with Jesus ourselves. Some of us may have that, but we, we're not really necessarily feeling motivated to go witness. And so I want to go back and just start with us, um, because we need to be clear on who God is for ourselves. God himself was crucified with Christ, for Christ was one with the Father. Have you thought about the Father's suffering? As a, as a parent, would you rather watch your kid go through the crucifixion or would you trade places with them? So for the Father to allow Christ to die for us is just amazing to me. Um, the other part that's amazing is why. We ask the why question. Why, God? Why did you do this? And it's because of his love for us. Our value is in the price that was paid for us. It's not anything we'll ever do. Jesus said, I love you this much when he, put a, when he put himself on the cross. At any moment, he could have called himself down. And as he dies, as he's dying, he's saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. The world says, you know, I'll be back. They, they, there's, there's like, you know, this whole, like, we're going to get you. And Jesus is never like this. I love you. I mean, all I can do is I can show you how much I love you and hope that you will come to me because I, I really love you. Check this out. Not a sigh is breathed, not a pain felt, not a grief pierces the soul, but the throb vibrates to the Father's heart. This was an aha moment for me. Have, have you thought about like a sigh? It's like, you know, I just got home and there's dirty dishes and none of them are mine, right? It's just a sigh and God feels it. He's so connected with you. He feels that. And then when we go through real grief and we feel like we're alone, he pulls in close. The Holy Spirit, there's a special work that the Holy Spirit comes close to us. And I'm not convinced if it's just because we need it or because we recognize we need it. Either way, when we are at the bottom, there's an experience that can happen with the Holy Spirit um, as we draw close, and he, he just wraps us in his, his arms of love. And I pray that each of you will have that experience that you can draw from um, when it feels like you're alone. And then um, he knows the depths of the world's misery and despair. He knows by what means to bring relief. That is a message of hope. And you know what? We, we are to be that message of hope to the world. That's, that's what he's called us to. And I'm embarrassed to say I've spent so much time working on myself and I'm realizing more and more that I'll never get there focusing on myself. That it's really when I step out and say, Lord, I'm going to go do this for you. I'm going to step out in faith for you. I lose track of myself and I have the joy of making a difference for the people around me. I was blessed to go on ICC to Mexico with a group of high school kids that... Um, just worked around these orphans for a week. And I remember when we left, the sadness. And these are high school kids, right? I am not kidding. We were an hour out of that place going home, and I don't think a word had been spoken yet. They had 
ministered. They had connected with these kids, and it changed them. And that's what God wants to do with us, each one of us. So I pray that what I've shared today will maybe open your eyes a little bit to how you relate to people that think differently than us, specifically atheists, that maybe you'll be inspired to understand enough about what they believe so that you can talk about the the areas where we overlap and that we are very close to the end. Um, I don't want to use fear as a motivator, but it's a reality that when we see what men are saying are going to happen and what we see the spirit of prophecy and revelation saying, we see those starting to overlap and that that, that more and more saying the same thing, it means it's close. And then lastly, I just pray that each of us will be inspired to understand enough about God's word that when somebody asks of us that we'll have an answer. And before we do this, I've asked Brett if he would have a song for us. shared this song once before, but um, um, shortly it's about God's love and how powerful it is, and this song has a lot of meaning to me, and Don, I think it had meaning to you when you heard it for the first time that other week too, so... um. Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Cause your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercies for me every day Cause your love never fails You stay the same through the ages And your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage And I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me And your love never fails is strong and the water's deep But I'm not alone out in these open seas Cause your love never fails The chasm is far too wide And I never thought I'd reach the other side Cause your love never fails You stay the same through the ages And your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me And your love never fails things work together for my good Cause you make Cause you make all things work together for my good Cause you make all things work together for my good You 
stay the same through the ages Cause your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Cause your love never fails Your love never fails Father, thank you that your love never fails. I want to just ask that... um, you use our church, Father. We love you. We want to learn to love you more. And Father, we want to we want to fill this church with fellow believers. So I pray that you'll pour out a blessing on each person here, that each one of us will find one person that we can start to love and share the love of Jesus with, and that one day they'll join us in our church family. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.